a man named John, was sent by God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. John is not the light, and he knows it. He gets it right, while most of humanity gets it wrong. We think we are the light. We think we are the most important. We think that the universe should revolve around us. More subtle than that, but that's pretty much how it works. And isn't that what Christmas is about these days? Just the perfect gift to make me happy. So that I can have the best Christmas ever. So that what I get will confirm for me just how important I am. We have so commercialized and materialized Christmas, made it so secular, so superficial and empty, that we have to struggle and make extra effort to make Advent a reality a time of preparation, and a time of testifying to the light. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Christmas, but I think we're a bit off balance. So first of all, thank you for being here tonight, for making time to nurture your soul and that of your family, for testifying to the truth that Jesus is our real joy, and that his joy is solid and not just some fleeting feeling. On this third Sunday of Advent, let us take our cue from John the Baptist. How are we, like him, testifying to the light, Jesus Christ? How are we, sent like John the Baptist, to testify to the truth of Jesus Christ, who is light for the world this December 16th, 2023. Maybe some simple questions for reflection might help. How do we testify to our spouse and to our families? Do we pray with them and for them? Do we ask them, how can I pray for you today? And then do so. Are we powerful intercession intercessors on their behalf? Do we make Sunday a priority for our family? Do we read sacred scripture together as spouses and family? Do we have a dedicated space in our home however small, for prayer, with images of our faith like statues or pictures of the saints or holy cards? Do we witness to our classmates and friends at school and at the workplace by not hiding the fact that we are Catholic? Now, we don't have to flaunt it, but we must not deny it. A simple crucifix, not just a cross emptied of Jesus, but a simple crucifix around one's neck can be a powerful witness to our faith. A t-shirt with a scripture quote rather than a Nike swoosh can speak volumes. A mere God bless you when someone sneezes can be a powerful witness. We don't need to be dressed in camel hair, munching on locusts, yuck. Our witness can be simple yet powerful from the heart, from a place of integrity and truth, a place of prayer and a simple relationship with Jesus Christ. We rejoice this Sunday because our salvation is near. We rejoice because of the prophecy of Isaiah, which is fulfilled in the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. 
We rejoice because we have heard and seen the testimony from the crib to the cross to the empty tomb. We rejoice this Sunday because we believe. Yet we realize how far our world is from the light and what a dark place it is for so many. Our world is being torn asunder with war in Gaza, Ukraine, Yemen, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to name only a few. Anti-Semitism, racism, scapegoating, blaming segments of societies and nations is on the rise, much like before the Second World War. According to the United Nations, there are over 117.2 million refugees, internally displaced persons, asylum seekers, and migrants in the world. That's one-seventh of the world's population. People are fleeing for their lives, and many lives are being lost. Marriages are under attack on all sides. The definition of marriage itself is up for grabs. Divorce is just another relationship option. Families are split apart. Stability for children, feeling safe and secure, has become frighteningly fragile. Millions suffer depression and a sense of meaninglessness and direction in their life. Addictions of all sorts suck our souls of the light and life, of joy and peace. Suicide rate continues to climb, especially among middle schoolers, high school, and young adults. My sisters and brothers, our world needs a savior yet it so easily rejects the light, Jesus Christ. Our world needs to be rescued, yet clings to its self-centered, self-made illusions of joy and happiness that are empty and fleeting. The prophecy of Isaiah from our first reading was fulfilled in the synagogue of Nazareth. Jesus uses the very same words from Isaiah to begin his ministry. And guess what happened? His neighbors rejected him and wanted to throw him off the cliff because he challenged their reality. This final week of Lent, let us open our hearts to Jesus who comes to save us and the world. Let us heed the words of St. Paul. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. In all circumstances, give thanks. Always. Constantly. In all circumstances. To not give up. Not just when it's easy or feels good or suits us. Rather, Let us always, constantly, and in all circumstances, witness to the light. And let us not be a people who grumble and gripe, but who are grateful, giving thanks. Let us, like John the Baptist, testify to the light, to Jesus Christ. Let us be a people who not only say, but live. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. So we have a number of celebrations today. Um, as, as you've noticed, we are celebrating the, the uh, Filipino tradition of Simbangabi, and that's a novena of uh, masses that precedes Christmas as a way of preparing and making straight the way of the Lord. These, these traditions of Paroles, right, that, uh, that light the way for Jesus. 
Um, and also, uh, from our Filipino community, we, there is a uh, young boy making his first communion, right? Thor is making his first communion today. So we're uh, praying for you in, in a particular way, uh, that you may welcome the Lord with light and joy. And then uh, I'm wearing pink, I mean, or I'm contractually obliged to call it rose. <laughs> and um, why is that? Because, as we know, and many of you know from I can tell from your attire um, that uh, it's the third Sunday of Advent, and the third Sunday of Advent is Gaudete Sunday, where we wear rose that introduces a little bit of light and joy into the uh, the, the anxious waiting of Advent, um, and so it's it's a it's an uplifting saying we're more than halfway there. We really only have one more week, and we can make it. So rejoice. But the name, Gaudete, can I get that slide? Yeah, the name. Okay, so the Gaudete, this is another language that we probably don't use much. Um, and uh, I'm going to make you sing in this language too. People tell me it's a good thing I don't sing my homilies, and so I thought challenge accepted. <laughs> so we're going to learn just this word. This, what this is, is the entrance song that would traditionally be sung at the beginning of, of Mass. And we actually heard it today um, in uh, English. We heard rejoice, again I say rejoice. Um, and it, that's what this verse is. It's from Philippians. So um, just this first word, gaudete, we're going to do it one syllable at a time, okay? This is the old Latin chant. I grew up singing this. So first syllable, gau. Let's hear it. Go. Second day. Day. Put that together. Go day. Go day. Te. Te. Let's put that all together. Go day. Te. And it continues, in domino semper, iterum dico gaudete. What that means is, gaudete, rejoice you all, in the Lord always, in domino semper, iterum dico, again I say, rejoice. And so that affirmation from Philippians. Well, um, it continues. Uh, that verse continues, and we heard this a couple weeks ago in, in Ordinary Time. Again, I say rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. What a beautiful message. And St. Paul repeats this message in our second reading, which we heard in Tagalog. Rejoice always. How can, I, how can I do that? Rejoice always. What kind of joy is there in my daily anxieties, in the turmoil of the world around me, in the death of my loved ones, or all the feelings that get dredged up around Christmas time? How can I possibly follow St. Paul's teaching? Because what he says next in this, in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. In all circumstances, I mean, let's be honest here, life is hard. And St. Paul knew that. In his uh, second letter to the Corinthians, he goes on for about a page listing the ways that he's been mistreated and persecuted for Christ. He didn't have it easy either, and yet he could say this. So where is his joy? For that matter, as we're looking at the rest of our readings and our theme today, Where's the joy of St. John the Baptist or the Virgin Mary? I think our first reading gives us a clue. These words from our first reading, which are written by Isaiah long before the birth of Jesus, they could have been spoken by Mary or even by Jesus himself. I rejoice heartily in the Lord, and my God is the joy of my soul, for he has clothed me with a robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice, like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem, 
like a bride bedecked with her jewels. So where's the joy? In my God is the joy of my soul. And that's true for Mary. That's true for John the Baptist. Hopefully it's true for us. And it's also, in a way, true for Jesus himself. God is their joy. And hopefully ours. We can't create our own joy. We can't make ourselves joyful. Joy is God's gift of himself to us. And we rejoice this Sunday, especially because the Lord is near. We can rejoice with Mary and John the Baptist in the nearness of God in Jesus. So that's what Mary is singing about in her great Magnificat, which took the place of the psalm today, and which we also heard sung beautifully in Tagalog. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, for he has looked upon his lowly servant. Mary finds her joy in being looked upon by the Lord, or we might say, in being seen by him with love and favor. And God becomes even more deeply the joy of Mary's soul when his spirit overshadows her and covers her with his jewels like a bride, conceiving in her womb God himself in the flesh. God, he's present everywhere, of course, and he's as near to us as love is to our hearts. But at that moment of the Annunciation, when God took on human flesh in Mary's womb, he became even more deeply near, so, so near that we can say that God entered into a marriage with humanity through Mary. And in Mary's song, she shows us the joy of a bride, a bride on her wedding day. And with love beyond all telling, she longs for Jesus' birth. Jesus brings Mary joy by allowing her to enter into the mystery of who he is. So Mary, with a joy that's also filled with sorrow and longing, she offers Jesus to the world as our bridegroom. And then Jesus brings joy to John the Baptist by giving him the joy of preparing hearts to receive him and of pointing to him as he comes. And John knows that he's not the Messiah. He knows he's not the light, not the bridegroom. He actually calls himself the friend of the bridegroom, or you might say, like, the best man. So it's John's entire purpose in life to point to Jesus with a heart of longing and of hope. Pointing his whole life to Jesus as John's way of entering into the mystery of who Jesus is. With hopeful longing, John already knows the joy of the bridegroom, the joy who is the bridegroom. John already begins to possess this joy through his hope and longing. And so like Mary and like John, we can also enter into the joy of the bridegroom through our hopeful longing, which draws our hearts to enter into the the whole mystery of who Jesus is and who is that. Well, Jesus is joy. He's the joy of God the Father, made flesh to give us eternal joy. Jesus knows the joy of being seen and known perfectly by God the Father as his beloved Son. And in the joy of being totally the Son of the Father, Jesus gives himself in joyful obedience. Obedience to the Father's will. And in that will, Like a bridegroom in love, Jesus joyfully gives himself up to death on the cross. And not because it's fun or exciting, but because he knows the perfect joy that awaits him. New and glorious life in the light of his Father's love by the power of the Spirit. And at the end of time, our bridegroom awaits us with joy. And he'll come to take his bride the church, all the hearts who have welcomed him and longed for him in hope. He will take his bride into the perfect joy of his eternal life in the light of his father's love. 
So now we wait in hope, and our hope is filled with sorrow. And with our hope, we long for him, and our longing isn't satisfied. And yet in this hopeful longing, our joy is near, as near to us as love is to our hearts. And we can place all of those unsatisfied longings, all of those sorrowful hopes on this altar today with the bread and the wine, allowing God in his own time to transform transform these gifts through the mystery of his joy, a joy who lets his heart be broken for us in love. Because it's in the breaking of his heart, in the breaking of this holy bread, that New joy will pour out like wine into our lives. So, friends, you sung it so well. Gaudete in Domino Semper. Rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again. Rejoice. The Lord is near.